Good morning and welcome along to another episode of Beyond Bitcoin. My name is Derek Graham and I'm here today with Kelvin Co, who is the CIO of Spartan Capital. Hello, Kelvin, and welcome along. Hey, Derek. Good morning to you and uh, thanks for inviting me to the podcast. Uh, you're most welcome. So many of you will know that Portal Digital Fund is a fund of funds. It has tracked about 250 funds. It tracks 25 funds in great detail. One of those funds and a fund that has invested in is Spartan Capital. And we've been an investor in Spartan Capital for a number of years now and a great believer in the quality of its team and also in the quality of its strategies and understanding of the industry. And so I've got this great opportunity to meet regularly with the, the various CIOs and at the last meeting, specially requested Kelvin to come in and join us. So Kelvin, you've got nearly half a billion dollars under management and your investments are mostly in Web 3.0 and DeFi. That means you really do need to have a deep understanding of this industry. So Spartan is one of the most active investors in this space in both Web 3.0 and decentralized finance and has close to half a billion under management, as I've said. What we've also seen is we've seen this extraordinary diverse view of crypto based upon price versus value. My view is price is something that goes up and down, is volatile, it goes through the Bitcoin halving cycles, but value is the growth in wallets, the growth in total locked up value, funds under management, decentralized finance, transactions, intercontinental redemption, sorry, redemption and payment systems. When you look at this space, how do you both navigate investing in it and at the same time determine the cycles of investing in this space and protect your investors through those cycles? Yeah, thanks for that uh, great question, Derek. I think at a high level, we have been investing in the space for about seven years. So we have seen multiple cycles and we do interact very frequently with uh, many of the builders in the space, as well as many of the investors in the space. And that sort of gives us a good feel for what's happening, both from the standpoint of projects that are building with user adoption, as well as how people are thinking about markets. And within Spartan, we now have managed three funds, right? So we have our liquid long short fundamental hedge fund that's been managing from that's been around for more than six years now and have seen multiple cycles and then we have two um, early stage venture funds that have been investing in many of these earlier stage projects so that all gives us a good feel for both the public and pu the private side of the market it tells us about what's going on with growth with adoption as well as with with price right and and as we think about the intersection between price and growth, we have a framework for how to navigate these cycles and to understand where we are at various points in the cycles. And that informs mm -hmm. when we should be launching new funds, when we should be investing, when we should be harvesting. Right? So that's our mm -hmm. high level framework. We also spend a lot of time, obviously, with risk management and portfolio alloc allocation. And I think this is where uh, we're particularly strong in, given our TradFi background. I spent uh, 18 years with Goldman, and I spent uh, three years working in a traditional hedge fund before coming to crypto. When it comes to managing risk, we think about a lot of things, right? So we think about portfolio risk from the standpoint of macro and events risk. We think about concentration risk. We think about things like uh, leverage. We think about liquidity risk. We think about traditional measures like value at risk, which is how much money we could lose in a given day within our, within our hedge fund. And then separately, we also spend a lot of time thinking about operational risk, right? So these will include things like counterparty yes. risk. You would include yes. things like uh, custody risk and uh, things like AML, KYC, regulatory risk, and so on and so forth. So we have a very robust framework towards managing the risk and making sure that we're protected across the cycle. And are able to then take all of that and help our investors make money. Yeah. And what we'd expect from a truly institutional grade fund, Kelvin, that kind of risk management process, the risk associated with managing a hedge fund versus that with managing a venture capital fund are a little different in some ways. Obviously, with venture capital, you're talking about a longer view in regards to the investment cycle. You're talking about a deep knowledge of the space and the actual sector that investment is involved with. And in fact, you even actively help 
venture capitalists, your targeted investments as you progress through the cycle. Whereas with hedge funds, they tend to be reviewing the market cycle and the price and navigating that process. So for that longer cycle like venture capital, you really do have to bed down to a degree and just view that it is a longer cycle and the price cycle isn't as important over that period of time. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I think you've characterized it quite accurately. And with the venture fund, obviously the fund lives tend to be quite long, right? They tend to be seven, eight, sometimes 10 year fund lives. And so we invest over multiple years and then we think about exiting those investments over multiple years. So in that sense, yes. the cycle matters less, right? And what we tend to focus more on are identifying the right verticals to invest in, the right founders to be investing in, and then working very closely with these very early stage projects to help them get product market fit, to help them scale, to help them raise capital, and then to ultimately work with them as they you know, get listed and become a publicly listed company or, or entity, right? It tends to be a very long-term relationship Right. Yes. And then whereas on the hedge fund side, it's all about ideas, right? What do we do in the market at a given point in time? How much risk should the portfolio have? What are the best ideas at any given point in time? And we think of ourselves as fundamental investors. So generally our investment horizon tends to be longer than most crypto funds, but still we're thinking about months rather than years. And, and if we make a wrong investment, we can rewind that or unwind that pretty quickly. Whereas on the venture side, if it's a wrong investment, you have to live with it for many years. Yes. And so because of the differences of those two types of investments, we have two teams actually, one focused on the hedge fund and the other focused on the venture fund. But between the two teams, they also talk to each other a lot because there's a lot of shared knowledge that can be applied across both types of strategies. I would imagine the VC team would be extremely good at being able to support the hedge fund team on educating them in regards to the sector advances, what sector's moving, what venture capital investment is going into, say, DPIN or Web 3.0 sectors of that, or maybe into certain sections of decentralized finance. That is a great forward heralder for the hedge fund team to be able to understand what's happening. But in both cases, you know, there's obviously discipline involved in regards to the aspect of managing that, and that discipline comes from traditional sort of equity investment management and past VC management. How much is past knowledge when you deploy into this sector, both in both VC and hedge, and how much is rapidly learned new knowledge on a quite a different industry? Because I've often said that it's not an immaculate read across from being an equities manager in the realm of equities in traditional assets and, and crypto space. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I come from an equities background. But when I started investing in crypto, one of the things that I recognized was the fact that in a way, crypto is very much like what emerging markets equities was 30 years ago right, where yes. the market is very volatile, it's very lightly regulated, uh, markets are very fragmented, and there's a lot of information asymmetry as well, just because you have a lot of retail investors involved. And to me, all of those ingredients were good ingredients uh, to have in the market because what it means is that it's a rich environment for alpha generation, right? Just like what uh, emerging markets equities was 30 years ago. Mm. And there are a lot of similarities in that regard. And that's what I, I love about the crypto market, right? Because you can really generate alpha if you know what you're doing. The other thing that I also saw as I was investing individually in these liquid assets was that oftentimes, at least back then, back in the day when we launched our hedge fund, I think people thought of crypto as just speculative assets, that there were no fundamentals, that you couldn't really apply any sort of framework to investing in crypto. And I, what I saw was very different, right? I saw that these tokens were actually trading based on news flow, based on developments, and in a way they behave very much like equities. And, and what I strongly believe at that point was that we could take the valuation frameworks that we use in the equity markets 
and apply them to crypto, obviously with various adjustments to make it relevant to the asset class. But yeah, we came up with a way to value these layer one networks. We came up with a way to value DeFi protocols and many of the other assets. I think we've proven that fundamental investing can be applied to the asset class. Yes, and I think you've probably added things such as Metcalfe's law and momentum and sentiment that sits out there into these particular spaces, the community aspects to a layer one protocol or for that matter a web three product uh, are extremely important. How big is the user base? How rapidly is it growing? Mm -hmm. How engaged is it along the way? So we've seen quite an extraordinary growth period in this. And someone said to me a little while ago in Melbourne, how long should I invest in this space for? And my statement to them was solid. It wasn't about investing in our fund necessarily. It was about my view of how long he should invest in this space. And my statement was for the rest of your life. Because this space is enormous, rapidly growing, will become a very substantial section of the asset classes, in my view, particularly yes. when you start tokenizing real world assets, which I quietly, whimsically refer to as the single largest reverse takeover in mankind's history. When there's a little two hmm. trillion dollar asset class that consumes $450 trillion worth of assets by virtue of reflecting right. it through this yep. uh, process. So when you look at the movement of the industry and I attended an event, of course, Token 2049, a particular section of that, when we had a panel of venture capitalists. And one of the questions was, do you think this space will start acting like a standard equities market anytime soon? And the answer categorically across all four was no. And their statement was intriguing and they said no because the investors in this space aren't currently the same investors as the investment in the sort of traditional equity space. So the driving factors of price earnings ratio or net asset value, et cetera, et cetera, which is just so standardized in equities, is not driving this space. Is that what you've sensed along the way when you deal with investors? And what generally are the investors' expectations of you in regards to delivery and performance? Yeah, so I'll say a few things. First of all, I agree with you that, yeah, one needs to take a very long-term view of the space because I think we're only in the very early stages of the development of the crypto ecosystem, right? If you look at the number of users in the space, we have, I'd say, at best 100 million users, which is tiny compared to the global sort of population. And then yes. secondly, if I think about how much of assets globally are currently allocated to the space, again, it is just a drop in the ocean in terms of yes. how much capital is currently investing in the space. So I definitely agree with uh, your, your first comment. With respect to how the space will evolve, I think when people think about crypto, they usually think about it as a small subset of a broader asset class. They will compare it, for instance, with, let's say, for instance, the equity markets or the debt markets, but a very small corner of it. Whereas I think of it slightly differently because I think that eventually crypto will actually subsume all the asset classes, right? Yes. In the sense that ultimately debt is going to be tokenized, right? Equities is going to be tokenized. Um, art is going to be tokenized. Wine is going to be tokenized. Yes. Yes, right? yes. Real estate is going to be tokenized. So it will subsume all the different asset classes. So it ends up being a lot bigger than what people think it might be. And then with respect to whether some of these traditional tools can be used, I think the fundamental frameworks are quite similar in that for some of these protocols um, or applications, you can apply some of the traditional metrics to, to these crypto assets, but obviously you have to adjust them for their, their idiosyncrasies, right? Just because, like I said, we have not seen assets of this nature traded before, mm. like for instance, these, some of these layer one networks are really like your TCP IP, right? And, and that's not, that's a public utility. If it yes. was, if it ever was listed, it would be worth a lot of money, but nobody's actually tried to value an asset like that before. Yeah. So I think that nuances that need to be appreciated uh, when investing in the space. So we could talk about this for ages because 
When you're talking about a rapidly evolving asset class, certainly one that can, as you say, you know, boom the traditional assets that we've got now, we are talking about an enormous level of education that needs to occur, both for sophisticated investors, retail investors, incoming investors, but really an enormous level of education for institutional investors that probably consider themselves very well educated along the way too. So it'll be a challenge for them to unlearn a lot and then try and work out what does work in this new marketplace. And to that end, how do you give guidance to investors who are new to the crypto space, particularly regarding how they can position themselves for success in the face of market volatility and uncertainty? We have to assume that those investors aren't punting on Dogecoin and they have been used to investing in the marketplace, equities marketplace, and they'll bring to this a view of how they balance a portfolio and enter the space. Have you got a view on that, of guidance in that space? Every investor is different, we understand that. But how do you think you would enter the market as Kelvin Co. without Spartan behind you today? Yeah, so if I think about investors, I generally think about two groups of investors, right? So I think about the institutional investors, right, who are starting to come into the space. So that's one group. And then the other group of investors I think about are the individual investors or retail investors, right? For the institutional investors, I think generally many of them are looking at the space, right, and trying to monitor it and figure out when they get involved. Yes. Um, but I think a challenge for most institutional investors is that there are there is currently no regulatory framework in most jurisdictions, and so it's very difficult for them to get involved. But they're learning, right? And they're observing and they're looking at what, what is available in the space and how quickly things are evolving with the hopes to be involved at some point. And I think these within these organizations, they already have a long history of managing risk, managing assets. So they do have a framework with which to do all of these things. What they are probably not as well um, endowed with is intimate knowledge of all of these individual projects that are operating in space and the latest technology and so on and so forth. But I have no doubt that given the resources that they have, they will be able to identify good young analysts who are very crypto native and bring them in-house to help them build a, uh, a suite of products that they can mm. ultimately manage. So that's how I think about the institutional investor space. And then the other group of investors, are obviously the retail investors, which I think is an interesting group because, and because I think for these retail investors, there are very few asset classes where they can participate in and be very early right, in the yes. life of the asset class. Right? If you think about the equity markets or bond markets, by the time these investors, individual investors invest, these companies are already very mature, right? They would have been around for a decade or, or even longer. So they're really past their growth phase. Whereas with, and then of course, in the traditional sort of private equity and venture capital space, I think that area is just generally very difficult for retail investors to navigate in because they don't have the right networks and they don't have the understanding of how those markets operate. Whereas I think in crypto, we these assets, just because of how early they get listed, typically after a three to four year time frame, you're still catching many of these projects at the very early part of their life cycle and you can be invested and still see significant growth. But it is, um, as you said, a very tricky space to invest in just because of the volatility of the asset class and not just the volatility, but the numerous sort of scams and, you know, fraudulent sort of um, players that are in the space. So one has to be very careful. But I would say that the key thing for retail investors is to not treat the crypto market like a casino, right? In a sense that you really want to think of it as an investment, just like you would approach an equity investment and to make sure that you control your risk and your leverage because the easiest way to lose money is to bet your house on it take on leverage and you get a 10% move in the market and you're completely wiped out, right? Yeah. One has to take, a, I think, a long-term view and to make sure that you're controlling your risk and you're making good investments. And there's a lot of information out there that retail investors can benefit from. Things like uh, the podcast 
uh, the numerous podcasts that are out there, Twitter and so on and so forth. But yeah, those would be some of the advice I would, I would give. Yeah, really good advice, Kelvin. And what comes from that is the fact that I think this is the first time in history where retail investors can be at the front run of investments. If they do their own research, they understand the space, they get engaged with it, they network with others to learn more about it, they can be ahead of the institutional investors versus be the poor guys that give the institutional investors an exit when the market places at a certain point. It really is an extraordinary opportunity for retail investors. But as you say, the casino world, which is fun, is probably more the meme coins and rumor-based tokens. Yet there's some exceptional solutions out there. And maybe the top three tokens are early entries into the space for the learning process of this. And then from there, to start understanding what the tech stack is, how the, industry, how the technology is coming together, how it's delivering to Web 3.0, etc., extraordinary opportunity for listeners. Thank you so much indeed, Kelvin, for giving us some input and and we've thoroughly enjoyed working with you and we'll continue to work with you too. All right. Thank you so much indeed, Kelvin. Look after yourself and may the Hong Kong cooler weather be something you'll look forward to and enjoy. Bye for now.